This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, today we have Jonah Estes, who is a PhD candidate from uh, American University. He's studying history, U.S. history. Uh, he's currently working on his dissertation that explores the politicization of American coinage and paper money between 1775 and 1896. Uh, his uh, research more broadly involves uh, questions related to the history of political economy and capitalism, American Jewish history, and the relationship between cultural history and private enterprise in the 18th, 19th, and early 20th century in the United States. Uh, Jonah is no stranger to the American Numismatic Society. He actually first uh, interned here, volunteered here way back in 2009. So that's 13 years ago now he's been affiliated with this with the society. So uh, it's great to have him um, you know, forever a member and, and friend of the ANS. Uh, more, most recently, he was a summer seminar student at our Eric P. Newman graduate summer seminar, uh, where I was happy to uh, act as, a, as a, his advisor. Um, he came in here already with uh, a topic well underway, so I advised him little. He, uh, he, is, a, he is a great um, person to advise. Uh, so today, without any further ado, uh, Jonah Estes, uh, please. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse, and thank you everyone for taking the time out of your busy days to uh, come listen to my talk. Uh, and I look forward to answering your questions. Um, so I'm just gonna get right into it. Uh, there are aspects of this presentation um, I'm not gonna, going to elaborate so much on, but I will make a point of saying, if you have questions about this, feel free to ask it. Um, later. So uh, my presentation today is titled Currency and Courts, Banknotes and the Paradox of Private Monetary Sovereignty in the Antebellum United States, 1787 to around 1859. Imagine for a moment that you are an unbound wage laborer living in 1830. You live and work in a town a few hours by cart outside Philadelphia. Your employer typically pays you with banknotes issued by several banks. And on occasion, you're also paid in US coinage. A few days after you get paid, you realize that no one will accept your notes. Why? Because merchants and shopkeepers learned earlier that day that one of the issuing banks had failed. Luckily for you, Robert Bicknell, a Philadelphia lottery broker, began publishing Bicknell's Counterfeit Detector and Pennsylvania Reporter of Banknotes, Broken Banks, and Stocks, and is accepting banknotes from insolvent or failed banks as payment. So you send $2, the price of an annual subscription, to the address listed, pleased that your otherwise useless pay is at least worth the cost of subscription, or so you thought. Instead of receiving the second issue, you learn by word of mouth that Bignell issued a correction to his original advertisement. Uh, the, um, uh, the person responsible for, uh, sorry, the person responsible for placing the typeface in the printing press input insolvent rather than solvent in the announcement describing acceptable forms of payment. Quote, nearly every mail which had arrived in the city for the past week has brought us from 50 to $100 of this worthless trash. Big now explained, we are sorry to see that so many individuals have been swindled out of their hard earnings and hope you, our various state legislatures will not hereafter charter any additional moneyed institutions without first being positive as to the honesty and solvency of the applicants. To add insult to injury, Bicknell's refusal to accept your banknotes kept you from accessing the very information that would have helped prevent the situation in the future. You found yourself, as you anticipated from previous experience, at the mercy of the volatile banknote market in the antebellum United States. Or to use Bicknell's description of the situation, you've been swindled. Lived experiences like this one are at the root of my dissertation research, which explores what I see as an intrinsic paradox in the antebellum money market. 
On the one hand, banknotes facilitated greater access to credit for a nation for a national pursuit uh, of commercial growth, land dispossession, and industry. On the other hand, on matters of fairness and commerce, people in the, in the antebellum United States questioned the moral basis of a monetary system in which each note was valued entirely at everyone else's discretion. What's the paradox? It's that the privatization of monetary sovereignty, this is the right of banks to issue circulating currency, led to the obsolescence of the very currency upon which that system was built. The weight of expectations on the notes on which everyone depended threatened to delegitimize the money system. And as numismatists, and perhaps even as collectors of obsolete banknotes, some of you might, might be collecting those, we possess material evidence of that paradox and are therefore well positioned to understand it. Of course, it's historical hindsight that allows me to describe that paradox. More apparent to people then were the risks associated with using banknotes and problems that arose when banks went insolvent or failed, which we today can see as symptoms of that paradox. My presentation today investigates a piece of this, which first interested me while sitting in the ANS curatorial area back in July. Uh, Jesse, my summer seminar advisor, came up to me to ask how I was doing. I was visibly stressed or confused, probably both. My research to that point had shown banknote inscriptions shaped holders' expectations of what they could or should receive in exchange. But I couldn't believe that I hadn't found even a brief mention of lawsuits between people and banks disagreeing over the strictness of those ubiquitous promises. Putting myself in antebellum Americans' shoes, I remarked, head in hands probably, where are all of the lawyers? In other words, where did law and its practitioners intersect with the history of banknotes and in many ways, the history of broken or unfulfilled promises? My presentation today answers that question. Unlike state legislatures, Congress, and the federal judiciary, state courts stand out in the historical record as regulators of banknotes. And I'm happy to answer questions about the legal um, uh, environment that prevented those other branches of government from re uh, regulating banknotes. In this presentation, I'll argue that individuals and banks' disputes over the legal definition, value, and appropriate use of banknotes presented state supreme courts and courts of error with a unique ability to define the monetary qualities of banknotes and therefore transform commercial relationships between individuals and banks. Although these efforts were somewhat limited in their effectiveness, 14 states' high courts forged ahead to alter these relationships in ways they viewed as fair, commercially workable, and thus exemplifying good governance. All of them dealt with plaintiffs and defendants who at the time of a transaction between them involving banknotes were unaware that the issuing bank had become insolvent or failed. Judges also had to decide which party should bear the financial loss inflicted by depreciated banknotes. Eventually, decisions coalesced around two conclusions that could not have diverged more. The first, such transactions were void. Debtors and payees had to repay the debt using other money. The second, lacking information on a particular bank's solvency was no excuse. Receivers of those banknotes in question were simply at a loss. So I'll start by making, uh, I'll make my argument in three parts. The first, uh, I'll suggest a new method for reading banknotes as historical sources, and importantly for us, as sources of people's expectations of banks and of each other. Next, I'll discuss how the uh, politicization of banknotes in the court of public opinion with its multitude of business interests and claims about banks' moral failings could never have adjudicated disputes over devalued banknotes. 
Uh, and finally, I'll discuss the competing visions for the United States monetary and commercial future that judges in two landmark cases in particular, the Ontario Bank v. Lightbody, uh, and it's not up here, but um, Bayard v. Schunk, um, uh, used their judicial discretion to realize. Uh, one final note before diving in, I gave a version of this talk to peers at, and the ANS uh, staff in July during summer seminar. So I apologize in advance to those of you who saw parts of this um, for repeating the same information, just uh, bear with me here. So uh, banknotes connoted different meanings uh, connote different meanings to the numismatists of today than to the wage laborers, bankers, marine insurers, indigenous traders, and others living in antebellum America. Uh, typically, numismatic hobbyists and historians focus on the artistry appearing on the banknotes, as well as the technology and business aspects of banknote engraving. They argue that vignettes, portraits, and scenes of actual places reflected and informed local and regional and national identities. However, we cannot be sure of the extent to which 19th, the 19th century American public read or paid close attention to the numerous dialects of banknote artistry. We can be certain, uh, however, that they did usually what, read what needed to be read first. These are the inscriptions that often appeared at the center of most banknotes, like the ones you see on the screen. These contained information that evidence shows ordered people's economic lives and specifically their relationships, their transactional relationships to one another. And as the historian David Henkin put it, quote, the typographic regularity of newspapers and store signs evoked impersonal authority. Yet banknotes seemed to represent a, uh, some individual accountability within a city of strangers. And in my view, the same principle applied in rural areas of the country as well. To understand why people developed expectations of currency issuing institutions, we should begin by examining banknotes and asking how they ordered those relations between individuals and issuers. During the summer seminar, I examined uh, around 125 banknotes and pieces of script issued by 80 banks, governments, uh, insurance companies, iron manufacturers, railroad companies, mining companies, a steam mill company, a turnpike corporation, and a canal company, all spread across 60 localities in more than, more than 20 states. I also read dozens of issues of newspapers and periodicals printed in the decades when these banknotes were issued. Simply put, banknote inscriptions contain the information needed to accurately judge a note's usefulness in the marketplace. Uh, so for example, you see here on the top, a $5 note issued by the Bank of Macon in Macon, Georgia, dated the 1st of November, 1831. Uh, and on the bottom, you see a $10 note issued by the Canal Bank in New Orleans, dated 2nd of uh, January, 1857. And generally, uh, uh, um, sort of uh, structurally, these banks are the same. The inscriptions contain the same information, the name of the issuer, denomination, location, and promise. And the issuer, denomination, and location of the bank are often bolded or appear in starkly different typeface than the promise. This became pretty standard practice by the 1830s. Denominations are also often placed in bold around the note in several places, both numerically and uh, alphabetically. Uh, the promise, however, is often written in narrow cursive typeface, much more difficult to read, especially for someone who may be uh, hard of seeing um, uh, to decipher. Here we see a $2 note uh, issued by the River Raisin and Lake Erie Railroad Company in Monroe, Michigan uh, from 1836. This one is similar, not the same, but similar to the earlier notes. Uh, one significant difference, an important difference, uh, is that it mentions that the bank's capital is $300,000. Um, this will uh, come up again in the presentation, so I, I thought it was worth mentioning now. Uh, as in the example I opened with, people would have used that information the, the, the denomination, the issuer, uh, the location of the issuer and promise 
to estimate what they could expect to get out of certain notes in, in any given day. So for example, here we have a banknote reporter like the one I mentioned earlier. So if I had a note from say New Jersey uh, issued by the bank in New Brunswick at New Brunswick, uh, I know that the text is rather small here, but it says one half, which means the notes issued by that bank uh, were trading at a one half percent discount uh, in Philadelphia where this counterfeit detector uh, was um, printed and distributed. Uh, and, and, and people would have done this regularly with their banknotes. Uh, information changed so frequently, however, about the value and the, the, um, the, tr the trading value of certain banknotes uh, that banknote reporters were sent to subscribers on a monthly, bi-weekly, and even weekly basis. Uh, they also became increasingly available across the country. So here you see uh, just this uh, a, a selection of the banknotes and the time periods in which they were issued. So for example, you have uh, banknotes from New York City, Philadelphia, uh, and Boston, uh, I've, I've denoted specifically which one is Bicknell's Reporter, the one I mentioned at the beginning, which was rather a, a long running publication. Uh, now banknotes themselves became more common as well during the 1810s and 20s and only increased in their availability and, um, and frequency through the 1830s and 40s. By November 1820, an estimated 266 currency issuing banks operated in the US, territories in the District of Columbia, and an estimated 1,371 banks were in operation near the end of the free banking period, which I have sort of noted here with the, with the, um, the dotted lines. Uh, more banks, more banknotes, more material expectations. And although some banks reopened, many failed and left depositors without savings, investors at a loss and depreciated banknotes in circulation. Uh, I'd be happy to also answer questions later about how banks opened and, and all the kinds of reasons that they ended up failing. Now, anyone who wanted to use uh, banknotes as my opening example points out, uh, was almost entirely at the mercy of the country's scattered banking system. This was especially true for people such as wage laborers whose pay was often issued in banknotes instead of coinage. People developed expectations for the usability and convertibility of banks' increasingly prolific notes, all with inscriptions like the ones I discussed earlier. Now, there are some important exceptions to this methodological workaround that I proposed here. Some vignettes uh, have provided especially, uh, may have provided especially useful geographic information about banknotes issuers place uh, a business and therefore where exactly to go to exchange those banknotes uh, for amounts closest to face value. Generally speaking, banknotes that traded at lower real value, uh, traded at lower real values, the further away from the issuing bank they circulated. So for example, if you were in one state had the banknotes issued in another state and wanted to travel there, and for the sake of giving the example, uh, may not have been literate, you could have read the image as opposed to the text. So here you see a $5 note issued by the Bank of the State of Georgia in Augusta, dated the 1st of January, 1857. And the vignette depicted in the upper left-hand corner is a view of buildings surrounding Johnson Square in Savannah, Georgia, facing east from Bull Street. And on the, in the lower left-hand corner, this is a, a, just a screenshot I took of that a, a similar location on the street, where on the right, you see uh, a, a more modern bank building. On the left, you see a building that now stands in the place of the Bank of the State of Georgia from 1857. And it's a little hard to, to pick out, but through the trees a little bit, you can see uh, there's a monument standing there that stood as well in the 1850s. Uh, the same applies to this note, a $5 note issued by the Farmers and Mechanics Bank of Cincinnati, Ohio from 1815, 
Here you see at the center, top center, um, a banking house with the word bank inscribed above the doorway. Uh, and on uh, on the right and on the uh, left, the name D. Kilgore. Uh, I've tried to figure out who this is, um, probably the bank director or a bank manager or even a cashier, um, but it's still unclear uh, who this name refers to. So it's possible uh, to you to have used these images to direct a person to where they could redeem the notes. But textual records have yet to demonstrate that vignettes of real financial institutions were actually used by holders like a map to arrive at the place where they could redeem notes. What we can do and do know is that banknote inscriptions were immediate indicators of both what holders might expect and of a system operating on what they viewed as debatably moral ground. Unmet expectations of banknotes usability and convertibility inspired criticism specifically about the meaning and trustworthiness of certain inscriptions. Skeptics of paper currency colorfully decried specific banknote inscriptions as unworthy of the public's trust. Notably, their focus is the inscription, not the image. One article published in August of 1819 in Philadelphia states that people grew increasingly wary of accepting so many unfamiliar notes as more banks began issuing currency. Quote, the public in general were much embarrassed in receiving their just dues or wages by being presented with notes of banks and signatures of presidents and cashiers of banks whose title they had never heard of uh, or whose signatures they had never seen. Uh, in another article, uh, this one published in a Washington DC newspaper uh, written by a, a pseudonymous person, Bonk, the person just names himself uh, Bonk, argues that banks couldn't be trusted to keep coinage reserves. They purported, as in the example I gave earlier, via banknote inscriptions to ensure that their banknote holders could convert their banknotes into coinage. Now this uh, excerpt is a little bit long, but I think it's especially illustrative of the point I'm making here. So Bonk writes, uh, it is a notorious fact that presuming on this sort of capital, men have made banks in less time than nature with all her ingenuity and power can produce a mushroom. And so prettily varnished are the outsides of these fabrics that they charm like the night blueing series, deception is stamped upon the very building, but so inattentive are they who behold it as to suffer the inscription to escape observation. He continues, he or she continues. People are apt to associate with the term bank, ideas of riches, of credit, of strength, and they act in relation to everything bearing this name, as though there was a capital to be honestly managed. Tis the association of ideas that bears a parcel of printed paper into society, and the unsuspecting farmer gives his grain, which he has made by the sweat of his brow, and the laborious mechanic his toil for a piece of paper, only because it is made after the fashion of a banknote, but which if the honest men wanted, if those honest men wanted to exchange for gold or silver or stocks of their country's government or any other stock, they would soon find that the wants of society are not relieved by such banks. So people's deep mistrust in banknotes and specifically with the inscriptions coupled with their sometimes reluctant dependence on banknotes as a major portion of the money supply, filtered into the increasingly partisan mudslinging across the country about the notes, also about central versus state chartered banking, and uh, generally about moral governance, what made government good. Critics multiplied, and so did their critics. Uh, so critics on critics on critics. Some of them had financial motives to advocate for the issuance of banknotes and even certain forms of regulation. 
To them, banknotes meant business. Anyone who interpreted banknotes merely as promises fundamentally misunderstood banknotes financial function. So, uh, for example, here, uh, Eric Bollmann and his brother Ludwig, two solicitors of investment from Germany, dismissed arguments against untrustworthy banknotes as erroneously short-sighted and shallow. Quote, that paper money must not be used because it has often proved mischievous is not a better one than this, that no beer ought to be drank because the beer of a bursting huge beer cask in London drowned a number of persons. So what if the failure of some banks caused individuals to lose money? With the proper self-regulation, banks could minimize risk economy-wide and therefore maximize economic potential through loaning money and extending credit to new borrowers. The brothers interpreted banknotes of well-managed banks through a drier calculating lens. Banknotes were a useful tool to attract foreign investment, foster enterprise, and gradually expand the US's commercial, commercial reach. In his uh, plan of an improved system of the money concerns of the union, which you see here on the right, uh, Eric Bowman argued that, quote, the attainment of commercial results is the sole object of money. The best money is necessarily that which answers the end and object of money most completely and most conveniently. Here he's referring to the, the material qualities of, of, of paper currency being easy, more easily distributed than coinage. Uh, and so what worked for business should also work for people writ large, despite any harm done to certain note holders through quote, mischievous fraud. Now, uh, this uh, plan that he publishes, uh, it published in 1816, um, the War of 1812 had only ended a year prior to its publication, uh, which left people in the U.S. unsure about how uh, about using banknotes like the ones that collapsed, uh, along with the banks that issued them during the conflict. He warned that the biggest threat to the stability of the country's money supply were quote new men. These were bank directors, bank directors with bad habits. Uh, that he feared would issue excessive sums of banknotes and cause confidence in the currency to decrease. Good bank management produced stable currency, which in turn supported commerce and reduced risk in the long term. For Bowman, nothing else mattered as much. Even Robert Bicknell's reporter was by extension part of the business of banknotes. Seeing a business opportunity, Bicknell changed his occupation from lottery broker in 1830 to exchange broker in or before 1837. Bicknell achieved quick success, uh, as you saw from the chart earlier. By late, eight, uh, by late August 1830, Bicknell announced to his readers that the periodical had enough subscribers to publish biweekly for at least a year. His and other banknote reporters met the general public's hunger for financial intelligence to make informed commercial decisions about the banknotes that they accepted and traded. 23 banknote reporters, counterfeit detectors, and prices current were published in Philadelphia, New York, and Boston between 1810 and 1866, with dozens of others published as early as 1806 in Buffalo, Chicago, Cincinnati, Detroit, Hartford, Connecticut, Montreal, Pittsburgh, St. Louis, and Zanesville, Ohio. A business that aimed to inform wage laborers and the banking public also profited from the unstable money market. Risk assessment rather than risk reduction was big business. Juxtaposed with market intelligence, Bicknell did use his paper to comment on problems with and politics of the country's money supply by praising moral and denouncing immoral financial activities. Numerous articles of his reveal his strong stance against President Andrew Jackson's plan not to reauthorize the charter for the Second Bank of the United States. One article from May 1831 argues that state charter banks were a dangerous and immoral alternative to the Second Bank. He describes, uh, a recent and prospective state chartered banks as meeting a need that didn't exist 
in the, in, in the marketplace. Attempts to charter banks and therefore, quote, throw into circulation a flood of paper money as unsubstantial as the very bubbles of the sea set into motion economic disruption comparable to continental currency emissions during the Revolutionary War. The motives, and I'm quoting from his article, the motives to an overissue of paper in state institutions are so numerous and so powerful that they have been found to operate in defiance of all resolutions of virtue, all precautions of prudence, all restrictions of law, and all force of penalties. It is the spirit of speculation, it is the passion analogous to that of gaming or gambling, which is seduced by imperceptible degrees into a vortex, which ventures a little at first and, proving successful, ventures more until the stake becomes desperate, the involvement fatal, and the extrication impossible. I'll say that again. Until the stake becomes desperate, the involvement fatal, and extrication impossible. Of course, banks and other corporations, such as canal companies and land brokerages, profited both from issuing currency and from the federal government's campaign of land dispossession and indigenous extermination. Herein lay part of the seemingly intractable problem that Bowman, Bicknell, his subscribers, and the US population at large confronted. Consensus was difficult to come by. There was too much money to be made speculating, so much expansion having to be done, so much money to be made from bickering in the partisan press. Uh, few seem to have, want, or have the legal means to implement and enforce a solution to the solution to the problem of supplying the nation with money. That said, even critics of those decrying banks and banknotes as intrinsically fraudulent and anti-laborer pointed to a venue where any disputes involving banknotes, usability, convertibility, or relative value could go. If uh, a note is doubted, wrote Bicknell, the person who attempts to pass it states he has received it from some individual who too often answers his purpose and he is allowed to pursue his course unmolested. The circumstance of the note being bad, he wrote, will answer every purpose in a prosecution. Simply put, the courts may resolve individuals' problems with the banknotes that legislators and the public would or could not. State Supreme Courts and courts of error played an outsized role in defining the legal and moral responsibilities of individuals and corporations that dealt with each other using banknotes. In 1834, the New York State Supreme Court issued its decision in the Ontario Bank v. Lightbody uh, case. Pennsylvania Supreme Court responded in its 1841 decision in Bayard v. Shunk. Abraham Clark Freeman, a lawyer and editor of a large body of legal texts, referred to this uh, as the leading case maintaining the opposite position to light body. Over the next two decades, courts in Illinois, Maine, New Hampshire, Ohio, South Carolina, Vermont, and Wisconsin all explicitly sided with the decision in light body. Courts in Alabama, Delaware, Tennessee, and Virginia disagreed, siding with the Shunk decision. Now, why focus on these cases? What makes the opinions issued in these two different from the opinions written by Bowman, Bicknell, or Bonk uh, in the press? The difference between having an opinion on banknotes and issuing a written one from the bench amounted to the difference between voicing discontent and prescribing legally binding rules to determine the outcome of similar disputes in the future, and as others had alluded to before, common disputes. Participants in money politics waged political battles over, for control over institutions that issued and controlled the flow of coins and banknotes in the economy. Judges settled disputes by providing solutions based on legal, commercial, and moral principles that, though not totally dissimilar to views espoused by pamphleteers and by people in the press, were intended to protect 
individuals in the marketplace from incurring unnecessary loss. Banknotes would remain political as they would throughout the 19th century. Plaintiffs and defendants sought resolution and guidance, which courts uniquely provided in this period. Both cases began under similar circumstances. Both were brought in error from a lower court. In light body, light body, I, I haven't been able to find the person's first name, light body presented a check for $500 at a branch of the Ontario Bank in Utica, New York, where he had an account. Lightbody then opted to withdraw that amount, at which time the cashier gave Lightbody a $500 note issued in New York by Franklin Bank. In Shunk, a tenant farmer with the last name Hickox purchased cattle using banknotes issued by the Commercial Bank of Wilmington. The notes changed hands twice, from Hickox to the Dauphin County, County Sheriff, who gave the notes to the plaintiff's attorney. On his client's behalf, the attorney accepted the notes that he understood to be trading with a one and a half percent discount and gave the sheriff a receipt reflecting his willingness to accept the banknotes and the minor loss that came with them. In both cases, individuals giving and receiving the notes were unaware that the notes issuers had failed. According to the facts stated in the case, Franklin, Bale, uh, Franklin Bank failed three days before Lightbody withdrew the money from his account. Lightbody then sued the Ontario Bank for the difference between the notes valued before and after the, Frank, the Franklin Bank closed. Similarly, the Commercial Bank of Wilmington had ceased specie payments on the day before Hickox gave its, uh, gave its notes to the sheriff. Learning this, the plaintiff in both cases refused to keep the notes as satisfaction uh, of, of the debt. So in Hickox's case, uh, he gave the notes to his attorney, gave them to Hickox. Hickox and uh, other defendants involved in the case refused to take back the notes, believing that regardless of the solvency of the Wilmington Bank, Hickox's debt was satisfied. The New York court ruled in light body's favor and ordered the Ontario Bank to pay him the amount lost on the banknote, resulting from the Franklin Bank's failure. Pennsylvania's court saw the situation differently, ruling that Hickox, Hickox's debt remained unpaid. Would it have mattered to the transaction if the notes were paid before the bank's closure? This is the question. Part of the problem facing Lightbody and Hickox both was that Banknotes lacked legal tender status. Coinage acts uh, issued in decades prior uh, by Congress each detailed which coins people could use to pay any debt, complete any transaction, or use to pay the state and federal governments. In other words, those laws prohibited people in the US from refusing to accept certain coins as payments for goods, services, or debts. So for example, uh, the, um, uh, in this case, uh, Mexican eight reals coins uh, were among those foreign coinages to which Congress granted legal tender status. Uh, implicitly, this applied to eight reals coins of any date and issued under any Spanish or in this case, um, uh, Mexican ruler living or, or deceased. People cared more about the silver content than the life of the issuer. A monarch's death had little or no influence over people's willingness to accept Spanish silver coinage. Unlike silver coinage, however, people generally treated banknotes differently than coinage struck and issued by the trustworthy moneyers of a sovereign state. Bank insolvencies and failures diminished people's willingness to hold on to those notes. Those market events therefore undermined banks' sovereign right to issue notes. And in both Lightbody and Shunk, people who received banknotes upon learning that the issuing bank had failed or stopped converting notes into coinage declared a debt they believed to be satisfied to be unsatisfied. Uh, in both, those who presented the notes as payment refused to receive the notes back and to repay the debt using other money. 
So again, judges in these cases perform the role of commercial regulators and money regulators and, and, and banknote regulators. They didn't have the authority to grant, grant banknotes legal tender status, only Congress had that constitutional right to do so. Instead, they ruled on whether, quote, a conventional regulation adopted by the common consent of the community was enough to make a banknote a satisfactory form of payment for debt, regardless of when the notes changed hands relative to a bank's closure. In short, they decided which forms of payment qualified as legal in specific situations. So in light body, uh, Judge Walworth and New York State Senator Minder Van Schaik argue that the banknotes could not satisfy debts, regardless of an issuing bank's solvency. Quote, conventional regulation was not the same as, as a constitutional standard for legal tender status. In that way, Walworth wrote, banknotes were no different from the state paper currencies banned under Article 1, Section 10 of the federal constitution. Van Shake concurred, quote, by law, this debt must be paid in specie if it be demanded, into the engagement thus to pay, every bank necessarily enters when it received its charter uh, by the state legislature. By the terms of this agreement, neither party regards bank currency as money. Banks and individuals who treated banknotes as a conventional representative of the legal currency of a country were actually engaging instruments more akin to promissory notes or to securities. A promise to pay was not the same thing as money. Banknotes used like money were not money. Objects, in Van Shake's view, could only be money if the law understood them as a means of payment rather than an evidence of debt. He went a step further. He argued that statutory regulation of banks at the state level was unnecessary. If anything, such regulation could further enable risky uses of banknotes. Quote, the convenience of a bank and the honesty of its administration are its safeguards. When these are withdrawn, law can render to its circulation no effectual aid. State regulation of banknotes use was both unconstitutional and unhelpful. Both Walworth and Van Shake acknowledged that the notes came to be used like money because of, quote, an extraordinary aptitude of the people of this country for business and trade to the immense amount of our resources developed by quote, industry and science, notably not slavery, he doesn't mention slavery, quote, and to the total absence of specie in large districts of, of the country. Such was the commercial role of banknotes, but it could not and should not equate to legal tender money. The judge in Schunk disagreed. He argued that banknotes used to pay debts always satisfied debt, even if neither party was aware of the issuing bank's failure. Banknotes, which people accepted upon the authority of, quote, the legislation of general consent, qualified as bona fide payment when neither party acted in bad faith. This argument, although relatively new in American courts, was familiar to them via British law. In 1758, William Murray, the first Earl of Mansfield, who you see depicted here, wrote the decision in Miller v. Race. In it, he assessed the legality of transactions involving banknotes in this way. He writes, now they are not goods, they being banknotes, nor securities, nor documents for debts, nor are so esteemed, but are treated as money, as cash, in the ordinary course and transaction of business by the general consent of mankind, which gives them the credit and currency of money to all intents and purposes. They are as much money as the guineas are themselves or any other current coin that is used in common payments as money or cash. For both Lord Mansfield and the judge in Schunk, the public's consent was as good as legal sanction, was as good as legal tender. Banknotes were good forms of, of payment in cases of mutual mistake for pragmatic reasons as well. According to the judge, transactions where neither party knew that the issuing bank had failed 
or ceased specie payments were common. The decision in Lightbody, therefore, leveled burdensome legal scrutiny on situations so common that, quote, if the wheel of commerce is to be stopped or turned backwards in order to repair accidents to it from impurities in the medium which keeps it in motion, except those which for few and far between are occasioned by forgery, banknotes must cease to be part of the currency or the business of the world must stand still. It's worth noting that Eric Bowman similarly warned against regulating banknotes in ways that could impede commercial expansion. What distinguished the Schunk decision from Bowman's foretelling were the implications that the judge argued Walworth and Senator Van Shake's decision in Lightbody had for the courts as regulators of commerce and specifically as regulators of the nation's currency. Decisions like the one in Lightbody, which identified the time of a bank's insolvency as a determining factor in the usability of its banknotes, could impose an unreasonable burden of proof on note holders to prove the convertibility of their notes at the issuing bank's counter before ever using them in a transaction. Quote, to do that, to do that may require a journey from Boston to New York. Uh, or sorry, Boston to New Orleans, or between places still further apart. Furthermore, defining banknotes as promissory notes could tie up litigants and corporations and the courts in, quote, a most distressing state of litigation. No contravents can prevent the accomplishment of fraud, and results devised for the suppression of petty mischiefs have usually introduced greater ones. Unlike New York, Pennsylvania's Supreme Court was unwilling to redefine commercial relationships in a way that may cause greater hardship for everyone involved. It chose to keep creditors and sellers bearing the brunt of risk. America's first grand experiment with privatized monetary self-governance struggled and ultimately failed to resolve through consensus. And here I'll just give some concluding remarks. Banknotes were more than an imperfect solution or means of commercial growth. They were as much an economic tool as a canvas imprinted by people's expectations of fairness and good faith. They relied on banks to regard them in that way too. Individuals relied on monetary and corporate intelligence to balance risk with reward when interacting with banknotes in commercial life. Without comprehensive state or federal legislation to dictate their emission, use, or valuation, and lacking sufficient enforcement resources to impose such law on the nation, they relied on courts to settle disputes and therefore govern banknotes' legal definition, uses, and value when banks stopped specie payments or failed. Eric Bowman, Robert Bicknell, plaintiffs and defendants all had an interest in a money supply managed in such a way that suited their interests. Antebellum state, uh, era state courts wielded broad judicial discretion to reconcile people's accumulated expectations with markets and moneyed interests, thereby addressing a paradox at the heart of American capitalism. Thank you. Jonah, thank you so much for that. Um, incredible talk. Uh, you covered so much in, in great, great detail. Uh, do we have any questions um, that anyone is dying to, uh, to ask right now before we get to any that are in the chat? I uh, see some clapped hands. I don't see any raised hands. Mark Tomasco, yes, please. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, it's particularly the distinction as to how the courts decided who was going to be liable on banknotes going bad. And that's a pretty significant issue. Uh, I'm curious, did you, you mentioned about reading inscriptions on banknotes, but I didn't, I, maybe I missed it, but I didn't hear anything about the inscriptions on the notes as affecting what you were talking about. 
So in searching the, the, um, the printed historical record for mentions of inscriptions and pe how people understand um, banknotes through the inscriptions, how they develop those expectations, most of the evidence I found ab about um, people's problems with the notes because they, they, you know, they see a promise made on the note and they don't get everything out of it that they want or need uh, is referred to in criticism of the system at large. Um, one of the challenges that I and, and others who study this face is understanding how you know, groups of people like uh, that we might refer to as everyday people, people who are not wealthy, who don't leave family papers, who don't leave extensive records, except perhaps in court records through the interaction with the state, understand these things. And one of the ways historians have tried to get at that is through um, understanding uh, people's um, perceptions of the vignettes, of the imagery. Um, but my interest in the um, my interest in the inscription specifically uh, led me to um, the references that critics of banknotes make to all the problems they see around them that people are raising with banknotes and the, and the um, misleading promises that banknotes and, and banks make. Um, so it, it's, it's not a, um, like a, it's, I don't have direct evidence of people saying, I, I have a problem with this. Um, what I do have evidence of, where I do have evidence of that happening is in criticism that refers to all of these problems going on. So it, it's sort of a backdoor way of getting at this question. Do you, do you, can, do you have a rough idea of the literacy rate among uh the population in the 1840s and 50s, because that would be another issue about inscriptions. I would guess that the literacy rate was such that a lot of people couldn't read it, um, and particularly people on the lower end of the scale. But people on the lower end of the scale would presumably have been paid in coins, uh, and, and even $1 notes early on weren't as common. So they'd probably be getting coins rather than banknotes to begin with. But do you, do you have a rough idea of literacy in that era? Uh, that's, that's a subject that's been fairly well studied. I haven't had a chance to get into that literature, but I, I appreciate you, you bringing this up and, and reminding me of this. It, it is an important issue. Um, one thing I will say um, tangentially related though is, um, is, and I didn't have the time for this in the presentation, but between around 1815, 16 and 1821, 22, you see a pretty rapid um, uh, development in, in the appearance of, of inscriptions and vignettes on the banknotes themselves. It, the, the, the formatting gets pretty well standardized uh, in many ways. And so, um, e even if an individual could not have read every word of what appeared on it, uh, people almost certainly would have been uh, uh, sort of commercially literate in that they could count. So the appearance of a number could indicate, uh, you know, it, it could convey information about what something was worth, leading then to a person's, uh, a person developing expectations of what they could get out of a note. Um, but again, the, the literacy question is an important one, and I, I appreciate you bringing that up. And yeah. I'm going to have to dig into the literature now. So <laughs> great right. opportunity. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other dying questions right now? I'm going to turn to the chat. We have a few questions in there. Uh, first one uh, by Adam. Did notes ever appreciate in value? Johnny mentioned a lot of notes depreciating in value, but did any actually appreciate in value? So they did. Um, uh, if you look uh, at banknote reporters between, you know, one day and another, banks that last that whole period, so let's say you're looking at banknote reporters from a, a, a year's worth, and you're tracking a particular bank, 
you'll notice, and I saw this too with the Franklin Bank that I mentioned in the presentation, that their notes sometimes traded at you know one half percent discount, and then it went up to par. So it'll say par. So you know one for one, and then you know next month it'll say uh, um, uh, uh, one sixth, so one six percent discount. Uh, sometimes it said three. So so these the values fluctuate. Why the values of specific banks banknotes fluctuated is very difficult to get at because uh, that question requires a hyperlocal study of what's going on in and around the place where that bank was located to understand um, what information was informing people's decisions about how to value notes. But you do see that fluctuation. So yeah, banks depreciate, banks, uh, banks notes appreciate, they depreciate um, much like the value of a security or, or of, a, of a bond. Um, uh, but generally, people's uh, fear, uh, which motivates them to read the reporters, um, to follow what's going on in the press, and to be especially keen on information about specific banks or people running banks, or again, this is all the financial intelligence, suggests that um, uh, their, their uh, joy of seeing the value of their note increase or appreciate is significantly, uh, takes up significantly less of their time and attention than people fearing that their bank notes won't be worth anything the next day, especially if they didn't know the bank had closed in the first place. Very interesting. I remember uh, looking at all the bank notes here with you, Jonah, and uh, if you recall, a lot of the notes that have been redeemed to banks that were depreciated, the rate of depreciation was actually stamped on the back and not written. So that leads us to believe and, and understand that the certain rates of depreciation were expected to the point where they actually created the stamp, a rubber stamp to, to for this depreciation, um, you know, which, which you know, is it speaks volumes to some degree. Right. And in many in many cases, people don't know what the bank will redeem it for until that stamp appears on it. Right. But the bank is well aware because they have that stamp ready to go. <laughs> the bank, again, the banks are not in this period, they're not um uh uh they're not there to um to support the public good. They're not a public uh, a public facing institution in the sense that they're they're serving um, some higher purpose, they're a business. And so or could you could you possibly though um, be talking about not a bank but a broker uh, who would send the notes for redemption and then the rate of discount that the broker established because I can't quite envision a bank refusing to redeem if it's a good note at the amount on the note. I'm a little puzzled at that concept, but I think the brokers who dealt in the notes, and I think there were brokers in every city, would probably be the ones uh, doing a discount. And part of that discount related to sending them for collection, I think. But so I, I can't envision a bank discounting its own notes uh, unless they're bad, in which case they'd refuse it. Right, yeah, I don't think that they're necessarily from the issuing bank. Yeah, okay, right. that answers right. it, yeah. yeah. Right, right. Um, all right, another question. Unless, Mark, you have any other follow-up from that, or Jonah, want to add anything? No. Sorry. Uh, another no. question, David Gladfelter. Uh, what was the role of private currency brokers in facilitating the circulation of banknotes? So this actually does speak to what we were just talking about, and in getting worthless ones out of circulation. So brokers play an enormously uh, um, influential role in all this. So Robert Bicknell, who I mentioned earlier, becomes a currency broker because he sees there's a lot of money to be made here. So often uh, currency brokers' role is to, um, uh, th their purpose is to serve their own business interests, right? They're, they're looking to make money. So often what they'll do is, They'll buy up notes, say, you know, someone lives in, in Philadelphia, a broker lives in Philadelphia and sees that there's quite an influx of notes from uh, Georgia, so quite far away. The broker will say to people holding these notes, look, I'll buy your notes 
at a discount, but you'll get something for it, probably more than you'll get at the shop or, or someplace that might not recognize your notes um, in, in the same way that someone in Georgia would recognize the note and be more familiar with the bank. So they'll buy notes up at a discount and then either they or one of their, their business affiliates or agents will go to Georgia to the bank counter itself that issued the notes and say, here you go. Thank you. And the likelihood of then redeeming those notes for a, a higher price than they paid uh, makes them a lot of money. Um, now, this also serves the bank's interests as well, because the banks are interested in um, maintaining uh, at least the illusion, if not the truth, that their banknotes are continuously able to be redeemed at their bank counter, right? Banks want people to know that they are, are constantly, they are constantly uh, in possession of the, of the coinage necessary to convert people's notes into uh, in, into coinage, and so these brokers play almost um, a, a a role in banks' PR um, in in trafficking or transferring these notes across the country. Um, those are the the two major rules. But but sort of if you're a if you're a, a day laborer in Buffalo, New York and you see notes circulating in your area that you hadn't seen before from a place several hundred miles away, chances are it's because a broker passed through the town and that's the money they had. And so they just sort of took a little bit out of whatever they had gathered or collected or bought at a lower price and it was paid with that. Um, so, so brokers play an enormously uh, influential role in, in, um, in, uh, distributing banknotes across the country. I have a, another question from David. Uh, who established the discount rate published by the reports? Was it an average of the banks themselves on their quote unquote discount days? Uh, so a couple of answers to this. Um, if everyone is acting in good faith, uh, everyone being the broker, the agent relaying uh, um, financial intelligence to the broker. So Bicknell had agents across the country relaying information to him about the value of certain notes. Um, and uh, the people on the ground just exchanging the notes uh, for in daily commercial activity. If everyone is trading the notes in good faith, no, um, believing that everyone is uh, exchanging notes that are genuine, exchanging notes from banks that are fully solvent, uh, and that are actively redeeming their notes at the bank counters. Um, even if the notes are trading at a discount, people uh, will, will read a reporter, see that same note that everyone seems to be accepting as trading on par and think, oh, well, that information is pretty good. That said, there are instances where agents uh, are paid off by bank managers or bank directors or cashiers to relay information to the brokers publishing the reporters to, uh, to sort of fudge the numbers, to say actually our notes are trading at slightly higher value than they really are. There's, there's something going on at the bank and we don't really want the public to, to worry about it. Uh, there's a little bit of, of uh, uh, a little bit of um, dipping one's hand into the cookie jars, a little bit of funny business going on, but we don't want everyone to know that. So we're just going to say the actual value. So it's, it's almost like um, fixing the value. Um, and, and a lot of people know this is going on. So it, it really is, this goes back to what I, a, a word I refer to often in the presentation, it's all about risk. It's a game of risk and reward. Um, and if you subscribe to a reporter, chances are you're going to trust it more often uh, than not. Unless you get burned by it. That too. That unless someone it, it publishes something that is so outrageously wrong and loses yeah. you all the money. That's true. 
Um, very good. Uh, a really nice question by uh, from Robert Ronis here. What was the lifespan of these notes? Uh, presumably, they deteriorate, deteriorated with wear and tear. How were they valued in poor condition? Uh, they were certainly valued less in poor condition. Uh, if um, if someone was accepting a note that was uh, ripped or or um, had a, a stain on it or that uh, that uh, made it harder for them to determine the genuineness of the note, often they're less likely to accept it, certainly at face value, uh, if not at even a discounted rate. Um, and with notes like that, um, generally speaking, they won't circulate as widely or as quickly. Um, and so they'll sort of cease to circulate. Um, the person with the note might just get stuck with the note. Um, banks, on the uh, sort of on the other end of all this, banks are issuing so much currency. Um, I haven't yet found, and and if anyone has a suggestion for for a, a resource that has documented the sheer volume of notes, I'd be uh, appreciative of that. Um, banks issue these notes in the form of loans often. So someone will come to their counter, say, I need a loan, I, I wanna buy this land. They'll say, great, how much is it? How much is the loan you need it for? $3,000, great. Here's $3,000 in banknotes. But you're gonna sign a contract and the contract is gonna say, um, you're gonna redeem, you're, you're gonna pay back the loan at 6% interest. 40% of the loan can be our banknotes. The rest has to be coin. And so with the rate at which banks are issuing loans, are sending banknotes into the marketplace, um, there is a fairly fresh supply of, uh, of not small, super small or fractional, but small-ish, so five, 10, $20 notes in, uh, in circulation, now, that said, when there's an economic panic, so there's panic of 1819, panic of 1837, there's, there's a, a panic also in the 1850s, banknotes just don't circulate. People are terrified to accept them because so many banks are failing and they don't want to get caught up in all of this loss. Um, so the, the rate at which they circulate and the, the time that they're able to circulate decreases significantly in those periods. Um, but in good economic times, they're generally circulating, you know, for really as long as the paper will last. That said, if the bank is good, if it keeps issuing notes, don't worry, you'll have a fresh supply. Um, I, I, I can't say, though, that, you know, they generally last for a month or two months. Um, I just don't have that very specific information. Thank you. You had mentioned uh, as good as or as long as the paper will survive in some of the notes in the NS collection, you can hold them up to the light and it, it's, I mean, you can see through them. It's they're basically printed on tissue paper. Uh, so a lot of these places didn't want their notes to survive. Um, so yeah. Uh, Jonah, thank you so much for this. We're past the top of the hour. Uh, this is a great, great uh, talk and discussion on uh, 19th century paper currency. Um, so thank you again. If you have any other questions, uh, you can uh, send them to anyone here at the ANS, uh, and we'll make sure that Jonah gets them. So thank you again. Uh, round of applause for Jonah. And thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.